Good morning. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to worship here at the East Church this morning. My name is Amy Pierce. I'm the minister of Burst and Fuchside Church, which is just down the road in Fingen. And this morning, Alan is taking the service there, and I am here for a pulpit swap. So it's my pleasure to be with you all this morning. I'm very aware that there are many people in this congregation who have known me since I was a child. So please be gracious and do not remember too many embarrassing stories. It really is a pleasure, though, to be with you this morning. For our call to worship, I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians. At the beginning of the book of 1 Corinthians, it says, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's worship the God who gives grace and peace as we sing our first hymn this morning, Lord of all hopefulness. <laughs> Pray together. God, our God, this morning we gather to worship you. We come together, each one of us from our own lives, with our own thoughts, our own hopes and worries. Let us bring our hearts, with all that weighs on them, before you this morning in worship. We ask that you would unburden us. Do not let us be weighed down, but instead send your spirit anew among us and clear in us a space to encounter you, a space to acknowledge your presence with us. For we come thirsty, longing for refreshment, 
We come hungry, longing for sustenance. We come as your children, longing to know your love. Here in this place of prayer, in this quiet, unlaboured time, we can trace the steps of the paths that brought us here. Our Sunday morning waking, our journey to church, our Saturday and the week that has been. As your people, we have known joy, comfort, fatigue and pain, love and hope, loneliness and strain. But as we cast our thoughts backwards, Lord, give us eyes to see the ways that you have been with us all along. Give us hearts to know of your presence, not only today, but every day, so that in our worship, we will remember your constancy in every moment of our lives. You are the God who freely loves. You have no needs or requirements. The whole universe belongs to you. Yet as infinite, majestic, glorious God, you choose to concern yourself with us. You care for us. You know us. In Jesus Christ, you walked among us and demonstrated a love so perfect that all human history will unravel before we will ever comprehend its full depth, width, breadth and height. As we contemplate your love, we are aware that we are weak and poor and full of faults. We know that we have no hope but for your forgiveness. And so we ask it. Forgive us, renew us, make us whole. For we ask in hope, trusting in your love, your perfect love made human in Jesus. And so rejoicing in the life of Christ and in the joy of the Holy Spirit, we ask you to restore us anew and shape us in your ways. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is like the first, a prayer. I waited patiently for God.
morning. Our first reading this morning is from Philippians, book one, uh, chapters three to 11. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have in my heart, and whenever I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify, I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And our next hymn is 694. Brother, sister, let me serve you. So I figured out the first thing that I've forgotten this morning about how things work at the East Church is that I should be in the pulpit by now, and I will go in a minute. <laughs> but before I go, I wanted to ask you a question. This morning's theme 
we've already had uh, read for us by Bill one of the prayers from the New Testament. And most of the New Testament after the Gospels is made up of letters. And all of these letters begin with prayer for the church that they are addressed to. And this language of prayer is what we're going to think about a bit together this morning. And I think the subject of prayer really touches on what it is that we hope for ourselves and for the people that we care about. What do we hope for other people? Because these are the things that we're going to pray for them. And so while I'm making my way over, I wonder if you would take a moment uh, and chat to the person near you about what are some of the things that you hope for yourself or for people that you care about? What do we hope for, for ourselves and others? Well, I'm encouraged. I hope that you are all full of hope for yourselves and one another. I wonder what some of the things were that you mentioned. I wonder if anybody was hoping for good health. Yeah, <laughs> lots of us. I wonder if anybody was hoping for happiness and joy. I wonder if anyone was hoping for a resolution to some kind of problem. I feel like that's a lot of what we're hoping for with others. I'm sure you had lots of other things. Our hopes for ourselves and others, that's quite a deep question, actually. It's quite personal. And these prayers, I'm going to read another one to you in just a moment, address some of these deep questions about what do we hope for ourselves and others? What is there to hope for. Perhaps there are things to hope for that are even better than the things we've already thought of. I'm going to read now from the second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 2 to 4. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we too may comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. That's just a short extract from that letter. So this morning we've heard two prayers from the New Testament, from the letter to the Philippians and from the second letter to the Corinthians. And as I've already said, prayer was the primary language with which these early church communities talked to one another. All these letters in the New Testament have a structure. They begin with a greeting and a prayer, they move on into um, various kinds of exhortations or encouragements, and they also wind up with prayer again at the end. Both of the letters that we read from today and all of Paul's letters in the New Testament contain the greeting that we've already heard twice this morning, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're ever stuck with what to pray for someone, I would suggest that grace and peace are a pretty good place to start. Grace, the unearned and undeserved favor, goodness, kindness, and generosity of God. We all need some of that all the time. And peace in the Bible is a really big word. 
it's not just the absence of strife or conflict, it's peace as in wholeness, peace that comes from God's presence. It's wholeness that encompasses everything you can think of, from our own internal wholeness and well-being, being made right with God, being made right with one another, and also being enabled to enjoy the gift of God's peace and wholeness in the restoration of our relationships with other human beings and with the planet as a whole. It's a big vision of what peace might mean. So these letters begin with grace and peace. They also then always begin, and I think this is very interesting because some of the letters get a bit snarky later on, but they always begin with giving thanks for the people to whom the letter is addressed. It sounds so simple, doesn't it, to give thanks for someone else? It's more challenging in practice, I would suggest. Because when we're in a difficult place in our relationship with someone else, giving thanks for that person can be hugely challenging. It can take us a long time to think of something that we're thankful for, maybe. But if we can do that, if we can start to be able to give thanks, even for others that we're in conflict with, it can completely reshape our mindset and our thinking. If we're able to start to give thanks for another person, we might be able to stop seeing them as a problem and start seeing them as a real human being, a human being made by and loved by God, precious and valuable. And if we were able to catch even a glimpse of that, it might reshape our relationship, it might change some of that conflict. It's not easy though. So these letters, we've had grace and peace, we've had giving thanks, the first letter that we heard today from Philippians that Bill read, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. This is a prayer that God will finish what God has started in our lives. Now, I don't know about you, you might all be a great deal more together than I am, but I am very much aware of being a work in progress rather than the finished article. And there are some days more than others where I feel that way. But this prayer is encouraging because it suggests that we are all actually a work in progress. None of us are complete, none of us are finished yet. But it's also encouraging because it says that one day we will be that however fractured and dislocated our present situation feels, that's not the end of our story. In one sense, it's true that we're not finished yet, we're not the finished article, but in another sense, the Bible talks about the salvation that Christ has given us as something that is still being accomplished. It both has happened already and is not yet fully realized. Both of these are true at the same time. And there are some images to help us with that because it's a bit complicated. Perhaps you might like to think of it as the Holy Spirit is given to us as a down payment or a guarantee of something that will be finished. So for example, if you buy a house, it's yours to move into once all the paperwork is completed. But if you have a mortgage, it doesn't completely belong to you until you have finished paying all the mortgage payments, which is a scary thought at the moment, but we won't dwell too much on that. But this verse is saying that God has already guaranteed all the payments. We've been given the Holy Spirit as a down payment, and one day all the rest of the payments will be made. Salvation will be ours. And it's a place that we are welcome to move into and live in right now. And one day, all of the things will be completed and it will be ours in its totality. So this is a very hopeful letter. God's work will be completed in us. That's good news for all of us. 
The next verses focus on the love between God's people. These letters, the ones that we've read this morning, are both probably written by Paul, but they're addressed to whole churches, and they're coming really not just from an individual, but from another church. And they're speaking about the love that exists between these churches. It's right for them to love one another. They're brothers and sisters in God's household. And prayer is a natural expression of the love that we have for one another because we share in God's grace together. And we also share in ministry together. Paul, the writer, talks about sharing with the Philippians both in his imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Now, these people are not literally in prison with him, so they're not sharing that in a practical sense, but they support him by praying, and they also support him in practical ways. They have helped him financially. They are providing various kinds of support, and so they are with him in that experience of being imprisoned. They also share in his ministry, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, which is speaking the good news of Jesus and living it. So defense would be talking, debating, explaining, and the confirmation of the gospel is perhaps more about being living proof, living proof of God's goodness on display in the community of faith. As Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. And the culmination of the prayer, Paul goes on to write, this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and depth of insight. This image of more and more love pouring out of us because we have received so much that it is pouring out through our lives and into the lives of others. And this comes because we understand more and more the kind of love with which God has already loved us. The second letter, the bit that I read from 2 Corinthians,